Hello and welcome to Transfermarkt. My name is Matt and I'm joined by Stefan and Ben to discuss the business being done by Aston Villa this summer. They've officially announced the signing of Jaden Philogene from Hull for around 16 million euro and they're also closing in on a deal to sign Amadou Onana from Everton for 59 million euro. Ben, I want to come to you first because there's a lot of business being done by Aston Villa. If with Philogene over the line when they do announce on Nana, that'll be eight signings this summer, taking their spending to 176 million euro, which will be the highest in Europe, surpassing Bayern Munich and Leon. What have you made of the business that Villa have done already? Yeah, I mean, it's been a really turbulent start to the summer transfer window for Villa. Um, I don't think any club would have been more active with uh, incomings and outgoings. Uh, I think before the transfer window, nobody would have probably expected Douglas Louise to leave the club and move on. Um, given the impact he's had at Villa Park in the last couple of seasons, being a key player and a crucial player to um, the success they had in getting Champions League football. Um, obviously, he's, he's moved on to Juventus now. Um, and they've recouped around, around 52 million euros for that, with um, Samuel Illing Jr. going the other way um, to, to Aston Villa. But yeah, I mean, so some of the transfer business, there's a lot of players coming in. The Villagy one, um, I find a little bit surprising in terms of, I, I get why Aston Villa are doing it. Um, and I guess the player probably didn't have much choice in it then, but uh, it, it, seems, it seems a strange one when there's so much competition in that position. Uh, Leon Bailey enjoyed a fantastic season last year, really. Um, developed under Unai Emery. Muta Diaby, Muta Diaby is a club record signing. There are some rumours he may move on this summer, but he still had a decent first season in the Premier League. He's got a lot of ability. Then you've got Morgan Rogers, who arrived from Middlesbrough last January and really sort of shone in that run-in towards the end of the season and came straight into the team and made a big impact. And then, as I mentioned, Samuel Welling Jr. is going to come in as well. So there's four very solid wingers there that Pillagy is now going to have to go and compete with. Whether Aston Villa are potentially thinking of bringing Pillagy back to the club and then sending him out on loan because they're a little bit worried that they have let a great talent go for 5.8 million euros and he's he flourished in the championship. If he goes and flourishes, it, it could be worth 30 million next season um, if he could, really can do that in the Premier League. So I, I think it definitely makes sense with that with the clause that Aston Villa had in the contract for them to bring him back. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a strange one for Villa, isn't it? Because you're almost going to be looking at a half a different lineup next season when the team was so successful last season. Where maybe perhaps you'd want a little bit more continuity. But um, yeah, certainly exciting, and there's a lot of new faces coming in. There's some suggestions that part of the moves that Villa are making with Dobbin and Robin and the swap with Everton and the the player swap you mentioned there with with Juventus could have implications of PSR but looking at it purely on, on a footballing sense Stefan like Ben mentioned there potentially half a different team next season there's a lot of movement in and around Villa do you think the players that are coming in are, are enough to sustain their status as a Champions League club now? I think it's a big if to be perfectly honest with you um, you know Ben made a really good point of talking to all the players that they have signed but a number of those players join Villa as really inexperienced youth players you know obviously Dobbins not played a huge amount of football Aileen Jr. from Juventus hadn't played a huge amount of senior football even someone like Cameron Archer who obviously did play in the Premier League last season you know joins the club technically uh, this summer um, is not a player that I'd really be relying on to lead the line for Aston Villa next season that might be famous words that might come back to bite me as the season goes on but you know, he's not exactly a kind of player that I would think immediately adds to that first team. Um, the only one actually out of that list is maybe Ian Matson, who I thought had a tremendous time at Bruce Dortmund last season. I thought he was a great uh, left back and a lot of clubs were after him. I'm quite surprised that Villa paid so much money for him, to be perfectly honest with you. I know he's only 22. I know he'll get better. But um, as we've seen in the Premier League with, you know, guys like Cucurella or Chilwell or, or our fullbacks, um, even a fullback, who's really romping it in the in the Premier League, um, doesn't demand a transfer fee much higher than what Villa already paid for Masson. So it's not as if they've picked up a young player who they can profit on in the years to come. Um, and similarly, you know, your Philly Jeans are a player who comes from success in the Championship, whether he can make a step up to the Premier League, whether he even gets enough game time to play for Villa last next season, as Ben pointed out, is a huge if. And then the other ones as well, who I'm still not entirely sure of as a Nana, is, um, as a potential kind of replacement for Douglas Louise. I know he's probably not going to be a lifelike replacement. Obviously, they're very different players. And I know Villa have a kind of ever-changing midfield where, you know, sometimes uh, Louise would move up front, McGinn would move up front. They kind of had this kind of tandem. So, and then Donana would be asked to kind of, kind of maybe fill a different role going forward. But I'm just kind of intrigued to see how well Nana does uh, for Villa on that side because I think at Everton, he kind of maybe lost his way a little bit. He kind of dropped out of the team. It's maybe quite telling that, you know, this time last year, there was maybe like about 100 million euro price tag put on him and that's kind of obviously dropped off quite dramatically. 
However, having said all that, I would kind of contextualize it with a point by saying what Unai Emery undoubtedly did at Villa last season was take a squad uh, which was largely inherited from Steven Gerrard. He didn't make a huge amount of changes to the team they inherited. There were some big signings, obviously. Uh, Paul Torres is probably the most obvious one that comes to mind, but by large, he improved the players that he inherited, and that's exactly what Unai Emery does tremendously well. So maybe Villa basically looked at his transfer window and thought, well, we can hoover up a lot of young players. Uh, you know, average age is, I think, about 24, and that's only because obviously Ross Barkley's coming at the age of uh, 30. Um, most of the players are 21, 22, and then obviously they can, they've now got the confidence to say, well, we've now got a head coach in place who's got a track record of making young players better and better and, and getting them up to that kind of Premier League level. But, you know, that would be all well and good if you're a Brighton or a Brentford, but obviously Aston Villa have huge demands on this season playing, you know, really competitive European football and a huge expectation on them to kind of match what they did last season with a Tottenham team who are also kind of doing decent moves in the window who are pre- presumably will be breathing down their neck. You'd imagine Man United would have every, every intention of kind of making a step up and getting back into the top four next season as well. So, you know, it's really interesting that Villa make a huge amount of signings. It's really interesting they're signing young players that Emery can improve on. But at the end of the day, I think it's still a very kind of risky move and it'll be one that we'll have to basically just have to wait and see whether it works out or not. I think one player that does deserve a special mention is the signing of Ross Barkley, who I think 12 months ago wouldn't would, wouldn't have been in contention for, for many Premier League teams, never mind the Champions League team, but the, the brilliant season he had at Luton last year, um, I think he, he deserves this big move back to Aston Villa, and he could prove to be, as he mentioned there, with the, the amount of young players that Villa are bringing in, an experienced head that, that could prove to be very important for... Uh, for Villa this season looking at the outgoings as you both already mentioned the big one is Douglas Louise who's joined Juventus in a deal worth over 50 million euro um, Moussa Diaby has also been linked with an exit this summer with Al Ittihad potentially paying up to 60 million euro for the winger I think uh, sticking with you Stefan I think an interesting point on any potential or the, the departure for Douglas Louise is that he contributed a lot at the at the top end of the pitch last season nine goals and five assists in the Premier League and I think you can caveat that by saying Ollie Watkins probably replaces those penalty numbers to, to, to a similar standard but having lost Louise in that midfield and potentially losing Diaby do you think Villa maybe run the risk of losing that, that core of the team I suppose that got them to, to where they are? Yeah, there's no doubt that Douglas Louise leaves a huge hole in that midfield. I think Villa fans uh, who are looking optimistically would say, well, you know, we've got Jacob Ramsey coming back into the team, who's obviously a very impressive kind of box-to-box player. Ross Barkley, if he can continue this kind of renaissance that we're seeing of him in the the latter stage of his career, if he can kind of return that form that we saw as a young player, then, you know, he's a tremendous number eight. He can play as a number 10, or maybe even as a a number six if necessary. So he could be a really useful player. And of course, Bandia's coming back from a long-term injury as well, I suspect, who was a huge player for them not so long ago as well. So, you know, there's a lot going there. And of course, Ollie Watkins, assuming he can, can continue the form that he showed last season, maybe a little risky to assume that he will, just because you could maybe argue he's slightly overperformed. I don't think even the most optimistic Villa fans would argue that he should be kind of getting those same numbers again. But we'll see what happens. I'm not suggesting he can't. Uh, but it's a lot of ifs and buts, as you said. And of course, Musa Diaby, who seems to be the most, shall we say, sellable asset in that kind of front line, who looks to be moving on potentially. Um, yeah, you're right. He, he, Diaby's such an interesting one for me because I feel like uh, when he was playing in Germany, he was maybe kind of undersold slightly because he's a very direct, very kind of one-dimensional winger. He'll do exactly, you know, as we would say, does exactly what he says in the tin. You know, he, he does what you expect of him. He gets the job done, but he's not this kind of multifaceted winger that a lot of maybe kind of modern football fans demand now, but he does get the job done. He racks up the goals. He racks up the assists. He's very dependable. Um, and, you know, and Vela may end up really missing him. I know they've got Leon Bailey. They've got Buendia as well who can play on the right-hand side. So um, maybe they are pretty well stacked uh, on each wing, especially when we consider the players that they've already brought in. But it's replacing a lot of proven players with a lot of ifs and buts. And, you know, I I do trust Emery to get the best out of the squad, but it just depends whether these players are good enough to uh, replace the ones that are moving on. But, you know, like I said, we'll have to wait and see. I know that's not a very convincing answer, but um, it's a lot of ifs and buts, I guess is my conclusion. 
Ben, what are your thoughts on that midfield situation? Because you can, of course, look at it as, like we spoke about there, losing a key player in Douglas Louise. But could you also suggest that maybe Villa are, are adding depth and diversifying that midfield by bringing in a more defensive player like, like Enzo Berenikea that we don't know how much first-team football he'd be playing, but bringing him in along with Amadou Onana and Ross Berkeley? Do you think that the, the sum of the parts is, is greater there for Villa? Yeah, I do think it's a very important argument um, bringing in depth this season because obviously they've not had to deal with Champions League football. We saw Newcastle, who weren't used to playing European football, go into Champions League football last season and that extra game, such a burden on the club, they ended up having an injury crisis and it affected both their European and their domestic form. Um, so I do think it's an important thing that they are adding depth in these positions. Um, and, and that's the, I mean, I mentioned with Philogene that they've got all these wingers, but they, are, they could potentially need them, so it could potentially make sense. I think with Barkley as well, it's a very smart signing because of that. Um, it'd be interesting to see sort of Barkley flourish at Luton because he became the main man again, like he was at Everton all those years ago. Um, he's, he struggled when he went to Chelsea and on loan when he was sort of in and out of the team. But it's hard to expect that he's going to start every week for Aston Villa. He's probably going to have to take, go back to that sort of role. So it's going to be interesting to see how, how he can adapt to that. Um, we've got to not forget as well, Bubakar Kamara. Um, obviously had that bad injury, but now they'll have him to come back as well. He's a top defensive midfield player. Um, so they have still got a lot of talent in there. And I mean, Douglas Lee, I'm expecting, I think he wanted to move on to Juventus. Um, they got a sizable fee for him. So, so maybe it was a deal that makes sense. A deal we wouldn't have expected a few months ago because he's been so good. But maybe from the inner parts of the club, it, it was a deal that made sense. And they have got a lot of cover in there when we look at the likes of, you know, Kamara, Hensi Onana coming in, uh, Baronet Shia, um, you know, that Barkley. So there's a lot of centre midfield options for them. Um, but yeah, the, the worry would be there's a lot of change. And sometimes when there's a lot of change, you don't normally bear the fruits of that straight away. You need a bit of time for the players to gel and adapt. And for Villa, they sort of go straight into deep in the Champions League. They sort of need results straight away. But yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how, how all these new faces do. Let us know in the comments below what you make of Aston Villa's business so far. Do you think the team is better with the signings they're bringing in or will they rue the loss of Douglas Louise? Make sure to subscribe down below if you want more chats like this throughout the summer. Hit the like button if you have enjoyed this video. And as always, thanks for watching.